Is it weird that it's a hot take to say that you enjoy a game? A game that is critically acclaimed across the board? I feel like so many people, particularly online, held exclusively online, find themselves inside these echo chambers of what is good and what is bad, and they create this law of the land and discourse about games. It's almost like having an opinion in itself is a hot take. I'm not a contrarian, I find myself falling within the general consensus on a lot of things when it comes to games. Red Dead Redemption 2 is probably the best western game ever made, and it stands a strong chance at never being knocked off that throne. Silent Hill 2 is a cornerstone in horror gaming, and nearly every game made after it has strived to be on its level. The twist in Bioshock is one of the greatest narrative decisions in modern gaming, and made video essayists everywhere run rampant with the term ludonarrative don't don't you say it. But I do have some original opinions. Go figure, a guy with a YouTube channel talking about video games actually has its own opinions on them. Granted, some of them go against the grain and have been known to ruffle some feathers. Mafia 3 was a massive waste of world building and strong thematic storytelling because the gameplay was bland and repetitive and lacked any innovation. Cyberpunk 2077 was a good game on release. I understand that people complained about bugs, I personally never got them, and I had a blast running through Night City. People were never going to be happy with the game because they set the bar way too high to enjoy it for what it was. Ubisoft hasn't made an absolute banger of a game since Far Cry 3 and they've been chasing that dragon ever since. But perhaps my most controversial opinion, especially when voiced to certain echo chambers out there, is that I think Fallout 3 is the best Fallout game in the franchise. Fallout 3 isn't a perfect game, but it is my perfect game. I understand the role playing isn't as deep as the classics, the shooting and the combat aren't as good as the more modern games, and the intertwined main plot is nowhere near as good as New Vegas. But I know these arguments, and I understand these critiques, but to put it plainly, I just don't give a fuck. Fallout 3 does everything that I value in the game damn near perfectly, and far better than any other Fallout title and pretty much every other game out there. And those things I value are things that I harp on on this channel a whole lot. Atmosphere, immersion, and exploration. But there are other fantastic things to go over that I think are truly wonderful as well, such as side quests, aspects of combat, and the music. This is essentially a love letter to Fallout 3, so let's take some time to talk about the good, the bad, and the footsteps of your dad in Fallout 3. Before we dive in, this video is sponsored by you! My patrons, you guys are dope as hell, and I appreciate all the love and support that you guys give, so here's a quick shout out to the real ones. Doug Smith, Anonymous Starkweather, Sofa Pals Productions, and Zachary Parkerson. Thank you so much for supporting me, I'm glad to have you, and thank you everyone who takes part in the Mr. Hammer's Discord, you guys are super chill and always a good time to chat with. Also want to take this time to mention GOG is putting the Fallout games up for sale for the next week in honor of this video. Fallout 1, Fallout 2, Fallout Tactics, Fallout 3, Game of the Year Edition, and New Vegas Ultimate Edition, all 60-70% to 70 off, so if you haven't checked out these games or you want to revisit them, I highly suggest using GOG, you get DRM free games, you actually own them, and they are always patched accordingly to run correctly on modern hardware. There's an affiliate link in the description, use promo code MrHFallout for that discount as well. Anyway, back to the video. I have come to a realization after years of playing Fallout games, Fallout 3 is the only game where the environment is the main character. The Capital Wasteland is top build credit. It seems like this world was built and put together by dungeon master Todd Howard and every other element of the game was dropped into it and made to conform to the wasteland. And when you got a main character like Dwayne The Rock Johnson front and center, you know all you want to do is explore that puppy and find out just what he's cooking. Exploration is king in Fallout 3. The Capital Wasteland is riddled with location after location, each with an intricate backstory and design that always feels unique, but most importantly, feels worth exploring. This was the first game I remember playing where you can see something out in the distance and decide, I'm gonna go check that shit out. And you can set out on your way, and unlike other games where traveling is mindless filler, getting from A to B in the Capital Wasteland is more complicated than you initially would think. For example, one of the first things I did in the game is go to Megaton. You meet Moira and you get tasked with the Wasteland Survival Guide, sending me to the Super Duper Mart. Not really all that far away from Megaton, right? Simple A to B situation. 
No. Leaving Megaton, I realized I never checked out this little town right across the street, so let's just dawdle real quick. I wonder what's in this cabin. The wasteland sucks, kid. Just get used to it. Well, that's a straight up lie. Ooh, an elementary school. That sounds neat. Oh, golly. All right, enough of that. On to the Super Duper Mart. All right, here we are. Let's just head in there and get the shit that we need and get- Those monsters, they're, they're gonna get me. All right, well, of course I have to help this kid out. Oh, golly. Okay, now that that's done with, now let's get to the store, but what's in that shack over there? You must got some important business out here to be wandering around. Okay, you get the point. This segment has been shamelessly stolen from DJ Peach Cobbler's Skyrim video, but the sentiment stands in Fallout 3 as well. Ha, get wrecked noob. But go check out that video, it's like a solid B+. Locations aren't inherently given to you unless you learn about them from an NPC or find a journal entry or a voice log or something. This whole map is... <clears throat> this whole map is empty, but... Really, it's not. And as you find your one true location to go to, the one that you actually know of, you are teased all along the way by new and exciting things to veer off the path and dabble in. All of this combined facilitates getting lost in this world. This wasn't a game where I was driven on loot or grinding XP from enemies. This was a hyper detailed world that I legitimately got lost in. Every sidetrack and distraction was an adventure and a choice not an obligation. Sometimes you get some great stuff by happenstance, but sometimes you just get a great story told to you. Take the Dunwich building. We all know how creepy and full of horrors it is, but going into it, it just looks like a normal ass building. Nothing out of the ordinary. But as you enter, you find a corpse on top of two ammunition canisters and immediately you start to imagine and piece together what happened here. Same as when you finally arrive to the Super Duper Mart and find the remains of bodies hanging all across the entrance in the parking lot of the store. Everything is so unknown and such a fantasy. Each location you uncover is like reading a new short story and getting lost in events and tales of people before you. Particularly the dynamic encounters were just one of a kind. Think of Brian Wilkes first approaching you and leading you to his town of Grey Ditch, where fire ants have taken over, leading you to a full-blown side quest to do. You almost forget you were just gawking at dead bodies at the Super Duper Mart. But there are tons of random encounters, like a wastelander coming up to you with a bomb strapped to his neck getting chased by slavers, where you can disarm it if you like, but it requires a high explosive skill and his head will go pop if you can't manage it. It's just all really great stuff. In a world now where you can have sprawling worlds that are beautifully designed, there is often little to discover or uncover in many areas other than killing enemies or collecting any number of items that are randomly spawned around the world in order to artificially say that you were doing something. There are no stories or unique events in most open world games of today, but Fallout 3 had them. Literally everywhere, you can stumble across an old woman in a shack who plays music and she asks you to retrieve a violin for her. Turns out, the violin's in Vault 92. However, she doesn't know the exact location of it. So instead of just getting a waypoint marker and heading on your way, you must first find the location. You may already know it at this point. Hell, you may have already been to Vault 92. But anyway, you go and you retrieve this violin and she rewards you with a private radio station of hers, playing tunes from the 50s with a lovely new instrument. The first time I played and beat Fallout 3, I never found Agatha. It was probably my third playthrough of the game when I found this quest and was absolutely delighted by it. But really, that's the whole game. Corner to corner of this map there is something, sometimes little, sometimes expansive, but always something, and always something so unique. Just thinking of comparisons now, like Cyberpunk, Far Cry, and even Fallout 4 and many others, the worlds are so cut and pasted on top of each other by repeating non-substantial tasks or collectathons instead of fleshing out a big world to get lost in. These games have activities, where Fallout 3 has adventures. Again, check out DJ Peach Cobbler's video on Skyrim. He makes the same point in much better detail than I can manage. He truly is an alpha. Piggybacking off the value of exploration in this game, it's seamless to start talking about the atmosphere of the game as well. There's no better place to start than 
the start. The intro to the game is fantastic. You have a 1950 style vacuum tube component flickering inside of an old radio, showing a little hula girl bob ahead that's a very subtle nod to the classic town, eventually panning out and showing an abandoned bust, military and vault tech propaganda posters plastered on the side before panning out even more and showing that the bus is obliterated, sitting in the middle of an obliterated street, in the middle of obliterated Washington DC, before an intimidating specimen in power armor shows himself and Rom Perlman busts in with the iconic line, War. War never changes. And before you know it, you're being born. This intro takes the vision of the iconic Fallout 1 intro and replicates the feeling to a T. It even has the Corvega ad in it, it's just, it's perfect. Going back to being born, the first 45 minutes or so of the game takes place in a vault. You are born, you get little snippets of your life as you age within this vault, you got your 10th birthday party, standardized tests that you take when you're 16, and finally leaving the vault when you're 18. This section of the game functions as a glorified tutorial, but it also starts off by implementing a lot of themes and functions that reflect the world as a whole. But once you exit the vault and you first encounter that beefy main character we talked about earlier, and you're hooked. This single moment in gaming is something that will always be top tier for me. Just the introduction to the capital wasteland. Everything within this wasteland has been converted and manipulated. Well, first by nuclear explosions, but secondly by people trying to survive. In gathering up materials and food or making shelters, you'll often find areas made entirely of scrap, but sometimes you'll find existing structures and neighborhoods fairly untouched and abandoned. Point Lookout DLC is a great look at how everything has been untouched and abandoned rather than ripped apart and scrapped. Contrary to prior Fallout games, Fallout 3 takes a strong hold on the retro-futurism aspect of design. The idea that everything is designed and modeled after what people in the 50s thought the year 2077 looked like. It's front and center in Fallout 3. Even though it's been years since bombs were dropped, people stick to what life was like before, rather than truly try and rebuild like Fallout 1 and 2. 3 isn't the only game that falls into this design aspect. New Vegas leans heavily into it as well, and I'm a giant fan of this choice. I love the retro futuristic ray gun gothic design of the games and it truly makes the game feel unique in combination with the post apocalyptic feel. And the post apocalyptic feel is perfect for me. Now narratively I can see why it doesn't make too much sense lore wise, it's been 200 years since the war, you'd think that things would be picked up a little bit, you know there's no reason to just have skeletons laying about in certain areas, but ignoring the context to it and focusing solely on the aesthetics, the design of the environment is beautiful. The rubble everywhere, the cars and buses scattered around, bridges and buildings collapsed, the dead trees, national monuments torn down, the craters and radiation dumps. Ah, it's just all so good. And I can't go without mentioning the Pip-Boy either. It enhances the immersion of the game and facilitates getting trapped in this world. Everything in this game is on your wrist, from scrolling inventory to reading journals and to checking the map, all done within the game. It's not perfectly integrated like say Dead Space or Metro Exodus, but it sure is good and the whole aesthetic of the Pip-Boy with the sound effects and the CRT screen look is just so iconic. Like prior Fallout titles, Fallout 3 is grim and bleak and deals with a lot of serious topics. The darkness is morphed into horror at a lot of points. There are several locations that are downright terrifying because of the atmosphere of alone. Let alone the first time you explore these places, you have literally no idea what to expect. Places like Dunwich, Andel, several vaults, the entirety of Point Lookout, and nearly every metro tunnel in the game were all terrifying. But everywhere is filled with bleak overtones, not just these named locations. If you can stop glaring at the beautiful landscape of the game after leaving the vault, you'll find skeletons at the vault door, remains of people pleading and begging to be let in and saved from this approaching doom. Springvale is just more of the same. Houses and playgrounds flattened, suitcases left on doorsteps, people were frantic and died in that frenzy, and everything is left for you to witness that. There are so many tiny and unspoken stories scattered around the wasteland, just left for you to dwell on them. Children's skeletons inside of an elementary school, plenty of corpses left after obvious suicide, surrounded by empty liquor bottles or scattered chems. These bleak tones are matched by the topics and 
themes explored as well. Racial tension between ghouls and humans. You see it first with Gob at Megaton, but it's all across the wasteland. Tenpenny Tower plays a big role in it as well as the underworld. Slavery was touched on with Paradise Falls, kidnapped children and adults alike for any and all reasons. You can even buy a slave companion, and super mutants take human slaves as well. You can often find them bound up right next to bags of gore. Plenty of instances of suicide as mentioned before, but sometimes we even witness people reaching their breaking points within the game, whether it's intentional or perhaps just by accident. Aww. And I want to briefly mention the combat here, because yes, it does suck, even for the time it was subpar, but there are some aspects about it that I really do like, particularly in the VAT system. The targeting system blew my mind when I play it. Yes, I know this isn't Bethesda's creation, but even after playing the isometric titles, Bethesda killed it with its rendition in the first and third person. The noises, the slow-mo, the gore, the physics, especially with the bloody mess perk, was just beautiful. Running and gunning sucked ass, but man I'd be lying if blowing a raider's head off in vats wasn't satisfying 100% of the time. Another thing I really liked was the variety of weapons. You got your typical guns, your shotguns, pistols, assault rifles, but you can also find specialty versions of each and some even more unique stuff with certain weapons being craftable from scraps and junk. You also dive into more of the futurism aspect of the game with laser and plasma rifles. You have explodables like missiles and the infamous fat man, and of course the melee weapons which were a ton of fun all on their own. These things aren't perfect, but they had charm and weren't just cookie cutter guns dropped all around the world. I can't talk about the music too much because I'm totally unable to showcase any of what I'm talking about, but the music in Fallout 3 is one of those things that's just like the cherry on top of a perfect birthday cake. It had the power to change the tone of the game completely. You can be running across the wasteland, bopping to some ink spots, having a jolly old time, or with the music turned off, you get this. And I really like how you don't have access to the music initially because the ambient noise is essential for the atmosphere this game is so rich in, but at the same time, the timeless classics chosen for the game's soundtrack are marvelous all on their own. Vintage sounds from days past really cement the retro futuristic vibe that Bethesda tried to hammer down in this game. The ink spots, mwah, beautiful. But then there's also songs like Butcher Pete which I thought Bethesda made just for this game. A song that sounds vintage, but it has this outlandishly weirdness to it. A guy named Pete who likes chopping up women's meat. Nope. The song is real. Roy Brown released the song in 1949, and truly it's the perfect song to pair with Fallout. It's a song about exaggerated sex acts and violence all sung over a cheerful tune. A dichotomy which is the spotlight of the series. Morbid tragedy served up with a smile. I know this is a shorter video and it's essentially just a love letter to Fallout 3, but it feels wrong to talk about Fallout 3 without mentioning some of the brilliant side quests that I didn't have the opportunity to bring up earlier, so briefly I'm going to run through a few. The Superhuman Gambit. This is another quest I don't think I experienced on an initial playthrough of the game. The town of Canterbury Commons has become a battleground between supervillain the antagonizer and superhero the mechanist. They think they are in this huge battle of life or death, but really the townspeople are fed up with both of these lunatics and you to put a stop to it. The um, mechanist and the ant agonizer, that's just what they call themselves. It's ridiculous, I know. Oasis is a green haven within the barren capital wasteland, tucked away in the mountains far north away from any threats. The player takes part in a ritual of the people here after being summoned by a mysterious he. After drinking some kind of fluid, you meet this he, who turns out to be a man named Harold, who is fused into a tree, being stuck in that position for decades and is eager to just die. He asks you to kill him by stabbing his heart, while the people that worship him want you to either expand his growth or to stop his growth, giving you three different options to choose from. Four if you just flambe the tree where he stands and piss off everybody. Harold 
world is a callback to the old games and is the only character to be in three different Fallout games, other than dog meat and the mysterious stranger if you count them. Shoot them in the head, a great quest with a little twist. A ghoul named Mr. Crowley tasks you with killing a hit list of people that he calls ghoul haters, and he wants you to shoot them in the head, as zombies are typically killed in movies, to send a message. You go to all these different areas of the world and kill established characters in the game. These aren't major characters, but they are characters that have roles in other quests, and some of them are leaders of factions all on their own. Turns out, Crowley didn't care about killing these people because they're bigots, but because they have a key to a special bunker that he needs all the keys for to access. But the quest isn't that simple. You can side with one of the targets of Crawley and turn on him. You can kill Crawley and everybody else and take the prize all your own, or any combination of things. It's one of my favorite quests in the entire game. There is literally dozens of great quests in this game. I can't list them all here, but I'd love to talk with you guys in the comments about your favorite quests in Fallout 3. Everyone has their own favorite. There isn't a solid right answer when it comes to the best in the game, so I'd love to hear everybody's opinions. I've been wanting to make a video like this on Fallout 3 for years, and I don't know if I did it justice when it comes to expressing my feelings and thoughts on the game. It was hard not to ramble non-stop about everything and try to make a concise video. I tried my best to organize everything, but truly I don't think I could ever express how I feel about this game in words, but I hope some of you enjoyed hearing my opinion on the matter and maybe share your agrees and your disagrees in the comments. Leave a like or you can dislike I guess if that means anything anymore. Okay, but now that I said all of that, and I haven't even mentioned the most epic DLC ever made for any game ever, Point Lookout. Let's waste no time and hop right into this babe. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message.